Let's just start from the beginning. Can you go ahead and, and tell me your name and spell your name for me? Sure, Teddy Gillespie, T-E-D-I-G-I-L-L-E-S-P-I-E. -E. And um, can you tell me, um, I guess, where you work um, and your job title? Western Colorado Community Foundation, and I am the Grants and Community Outreach Director. Can you describe for me your average day? And um, it can be pre-pandemic, uh, it can be currently, um, kind of like, I think what we wanna see is sort of the difference in how, um, if, if at all COVID's affected your daily work life. Sure, um, in some ways, it, it has not affected my work life because I stay very busy at our office. Our community foundation covers seven counties. So I am um, always reaching out to and talking with our nonprofits, working with our local community funds. Um, I do a good amount of the community outreach or marketing. Um, so m my work life is fairly, you know, <laughs> stable in terms of being at the office and just doing um, a lot daily. What has changed is that we are now all working from home. We're fortunate in that our jobs um, are such that you can do that. A lot of what I do is on the computer anyways. The Zoom meetings have um, kept uh, our ability to meet as a staff, meet with um, stakeholders and partners, nonprofits, et cetera. Um, although in a very different way, one of the things that has changed is I did do a fair amount of being out there in our communities um, and just going to see nonprofits, site visits, um, going to our other counties, which is certainly something that's not happening at all right now, um, checking in with people, having meetings, and really a big part of my job is also just directly in Mesa County being the hub of our counties, um, working with our local community impact council, having lots of meetings and working with our nonprofits who collaborate and um, and support each other. So that is a big thing that changed. And then, of course, the nature of this pandemic itself through everybody's lives into, um, uh, into turmoil. Um, and so in our grant making, our community foundation really wanted to and needed to respond really quickly. Rapid response, right, is the big term everybody is sort of using during this time um, as funders because we knew that people's employment boom stopped. There was nothing gradual about this. Um, nonprofits not only had to pivot the way they are having to work with their clients and, um, uh, and have their services and their programs, um, they also saw major shifts, uh, whether it was funding with program resources not coming in anymore or volunteers, especially if you had an elderly base of volunteers, um, that really changed. So a lot of what we have been doing at the foundation is really all of that discussion, as much communications as possible with our nonprofits. What do they need? Um, how soon can we get it to them? Um, and then really the base of what we do being the donor side, um, having donors reaching out and wanting to respond to all of these needs that they're seeing in the community. So it's been, um, <laughs> you would think um, staying at home and working from home might be the leisurely pace. Um, it has not been by any means, um, but it's good work and, <clears throat> and um, it feels good to be doing something very useful and providing resources during this, this tough time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, we've, it's been a few weeks now <clears throat> and 
I'm wondering, have you seen the needs of what our community our, of our community change? Are they changing? Are they still basic fundamental needs for you know housing or food or are, are there any that you're getting for support? Yeah, um, I don't, I wouldn't say the needs of our community have changed. I think they have been um, exacerbated. Uh, so if we had, you know, and, and we certainly do have challenges for people either um, homeless or in transition or struggling with stable housing, um, then you see that all exacerbated. Um, in our homeless population, we, if you don't have a roof over your head or even a car to get into, you can't shelter. Um, <clears throat> you are, you know, already dealing with a number of challenges, whether it's mental health or um, just real instability. And so then it becomes quite challenging to live um, the way you do, whether it is in a shelter itself or um, in a non-sheltered camp or other. Um, <clears throat> and then, and that just, you know, I think the normal um, average person is having these challenges of like, what? My life isn't normal anymore, but imagine it with those same challenges. So we've sort of seen those things exacerbated. Our food pantries, of course, have been the first line and hardest hit. Um, so we have seen numbers in terms of, you know, <clears throat> the escalation of need out there as high as 300 to 500 percent, um, where our food pantries were always working with um, a, a segment of our population that struggled with food security um, <clears throat> and having regular you know, a regular program where we help to feed our community that are struggling with that, all of a sudden, boom, you saw those numbers escalate. Um, <clears throat> and so many people become unemployed so quickly. Um, the food banks are the first to feel it. And they, I think, stay the longest in terms of the needs. So that's really where our community foundation has focused a lot of our um, <clears throat> of our resources, both food pantries and shelter, you know, trying to meet those basic needs um, for people that were already struggling, but then all of the additional people that have found themselves challenged. I spoke with um, Sher Sh uh, Shannon Robinson yesterday, who was talking about youth and homelessness and how, you know, their idea of risk um, isn't quite the same as, as older folks. And the challenges that she's working with with the youth to um, who face so many other issues um, on a daily basis. Can you speak to um, perhaps the effects of um, disparities among different groups in um, our region? I know you did just a little bit, but how? Um, well, Maybe how people have gotten to together to to work to improve things. Are there any positives? Oh, sure. There's a lot of positives, and I'd love to talk about that because really that is what you know makes you so proud of your community and the resilience of getting through something like that. But just a note on the disparities that you tend to see. I think you know our nonprofit communities sort of know that when you have issues in the community of struggles and, you know, kind of inequality in terms of if you have a, a high population that's working, right? But we call it the working poor. And so they're struggling. They're usually working two to three jobs to put together that kind of stable, you know, income. Um, <clears throat> but it's typically paycheck to paycheck. Um, so that is a huge disparity that we see in our communities. And something like this, just really illuminates it further. Um, and, you know, whether it's healthcare, so, you know, if I have good health insurance, I feel I can go to the doctor anytime, I can immediately take advantage of telemedicine um, because I have, you know, technology and 
good internet and sometimes <laughs> and, um, and all of those things, but you know, our populations who are struggling do not. So that sort of even widens the gap even more and illuminates, you know, people who don't have so much in our communities are really at a further dis disadvantage with this. Um, and so, you know, if you're living paycheck to paycheck and that paycheck is not coming in at all anymore, then you're making some really tough decisions in terms of, you know, do I pay my rent or do I put food on the table? Can I afford to stay home? Or if I see something, uh, you know, a job, am I going to take it no matter what the risk is to my health? I think you know, those are some of the biggest differences that we see. And um, I think one of the things our nonprofit community um, and, and something that does, is a point of hope is that the way we come together in our communities, especially on the Western Slope, especially what I see here in Mesa County, um, we have groups and people working together who maybe did before, but in this time, it's really an all hands on deck. Um, so we've worked with, you know, corporate partners before in terms of um, starting a fund at our community foundation, wanting to impact, you know, homeless and housing assistance issues. Um, that's their job, Bray Real Estate. But then something like this happens and they come together and foster, you um, foster a, um, a creative solution with other community leaders, the chamber and donors, and everyone had come together and created a fund really quickly. Like, you know, the rapid response, again, is what we saw. Um, and so the fund, Caring for Our Home Community, is, um, is that um, we can make grants out of the fund, we, our community foundation, two nonprofits that are providing food in the community, um, but the way they're doing it is purchasing food from our locally owned restaurants who can provide either, um, you know, big family style meals for something like the Joseph Center where they feed 30 to 40 people a day who come in from their cars and, you know, various places. Um, distancing, of course, so it's even more challenging for them, but also um, the fact that they then are helping our local economy, the restaurant, um, and providing food to their clients. Um, uh, you mentioned Shannon and Karis, the house. Um, they are one of the recipients of that fund, so they can go and get um, food for their youth. And, you know, in people who are struggling with things and often are re the recipients of the canned food that you didn't want out of your cabinet or, um, you know, just really not, you know, to suddenly have the opportunity to feed them a meal from one of our restaurants and then benefiting those restaurants who are 70 to 80% down because of their, they can't do their dine-in option. That's a win-win for the community. Um, so we've seen great things like that. We, we've been holding a virtual canned food drive, um, cash not cans, um, because our food pantries can no longer accept um, the canned goods that the community is usually always on a regular basis gathering. We've got a generous community to begin with, but something like this, um, our community can't give the cans. So Why is that? Um, because they um, won the um, uh, the kind of threat of um, somebody else's things from their home. So taking in those cans and packages and dried goods, um, there's a level of risk. Um, so they, you know, by health department standards and everything else, they stopped collecting. The other part of that is so many of our food banks have um, older senior volunteers who are there to kind of help process and package and do all of those things that our food banks don't have. You know, they're typically one and two people at the most staff, but a legion of volunteers, right? Well, those volunteers are seniors at the highest risk. And so 
there went the volunteers. So the food banks really had to pivot um, and figure out ways to serve not just their regular amount of clients, but hugely escalated amounts of clients. So, um, you know, we, we as a community foundation are trying to foster and lead and convene the best kinds of solutions. Um, again, a generous community, but in this time, one of the things I've just been, you know, really pleased to see is how innovative our community has responded um, and how much everybody just wants to pitch in and do the right thing. Um, I'm wondering about the long-term effects of this on people who are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I just watched a webinar yesterday about, about housing and eviction and how the eviction, um, I don't know if the right word is moratorium, it's, is off effective May 1st. Um, but that renters, you know, they're still responsible for Correct. and how, like, how that long, that judgment, you know, if, if they are evicted and they still owe how, you know, money to their landlord and it just hangs on, um, in their credit history and blocks more opportunities for them in the future. I just see that as one example of how this is going to affect people for a long time even after the threat of the virus is gone, um, perhaps, you know, for years and years to come, have you, do you have anything to say about that? Sure, um, housing is a, a perfect illustration um, of what, you know, a Band-Aid solution as, as well intentioned as some of the, you know, federal funding and things like moratoriums, um, well intentioned, but, really uh, people who are already on the edge, um, this is just something that's going to affect their lives, as you say, for many, many months, years, perhaps, probably to come. And I think it's going to illuminate, you know, uh, on the national picture, there is no, there's no doubt and there's no masking people talking about the uh, fact that this is going to affect all of us for many years. The economy is not going to just turn on a dime. Um, it's going to be very slow to come back. And the people at the bottom already struggling are in the worst situation. You, you don't have money in the bank to kind of see you through, pay that rent. Um, we know, and we've heard across our counties with the moratorium, not all landlords are... Uh, respecting that. Um, so we have, you know, high levels of immigrant populations in some areas. Um, We're hearing that they are not getting any break on rent. So even more important that those nonprofits are there um, to assist with rent and utility assistance. The last thing you want to see is people who are struggling, who really are making the hardest efforts. And these are families we're talking about um, that um, you don't want to see them, you know, out on the streets and then causing even more. It's like a, it's like a constant, you know, kind of um, cycle. Um, you use this and then this happens and then a car needs repair. You don't have money to repair. Suddenly you're really without any resources. Um, and one of the, you know, locally are, Doors to Success, which is a nonprofit arm of the Housing Authority. One of the things we talked about and we wanted to help with is the fact that um, they have a, a large amount of clients that are not federally subsidized, but they're really living paycheck to paycheck and they struggle to pay their rent. And Doors to Success tries to help with an array of services. Um, but they even pointed out that during this moratorium, the last thing is they wanted for their clients is to go in the hole. So while it may sound good to not pay your rent for April and even May, um, <clears throat> which I think it is ending in May, um, you, as you pointed out, you still owe that money um, and you're still unemployed. So June 1 comes and you're doubly, you know, in debt. So that's what they're trying to help their clients with so that they don't, you know, kind of go over that edge. 
any further than they already are. So um, you're right, this is gonna impact for a long, long time to come. You think about the kiddos being um, all homeschooled, parents are doing a heroic job um, trying to get through this time. Many people working from home and trying to homeschool their kids. Um, but I think that's gonna have a lasting effect on the psyche. Um, I talked about our rapid response and the base, basic needs of food and shelter, but we're really just as much, if not more, concerned about the mental health in our communities. We're already a community that struggled with suicide um, rates. And so you just don't know. There's a lot of anxiety around this, a lot of people isolating at home that are not seeing and having that human touch um, that's so important in all of our lives. So we're, we're going to see, I think, impacts of that for many years to come as well. It's totally up to you. Do you have any personal stories that you'd like to share about your imp the impact of COVID on, on you or your family or anyone close to you? You don't have to answer that question if you don't want to, but it's, um, it's you know, often uh, interesting and touching to people if, if they can see the, the direct impact, if you have a story. Sure. Um, well, again, I'm, I am very fortunate, and I don't take that for granted. Um, every day, I think, I'm getting up in a warm house or now a too hot house, and <laughs> we're going to try and cool down here, get the old swamp going, but um, I wake up every day and feel very blessed for the life I have and the career I have in giving, you know, back and working with our nonprofits and making our community better. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm a mom and I watch my 19 year old um, going through this. Luckily, she's you know, past the high school stage, because I can't imagine, you know, having a senior this year and saying, oh, honey, you worked so hard, but um, there's no big celebration to be had. And, um, and, and, and that's a thing that helps our young adults move on, right? Um, but, you know, I've watched my daughter kind of both go from, okay, I get it, uh, you know, if needs to be safe and take precautions to, I'm a 19 year old mom, we're getting together. I want to see my friends. What in, in almost uh, like a feeling of, um, well, you know, things were bad enough with the world to begin with. She's a kid that thinks about climate change and all of the um, people struggling with food insecurity and mental health issues. And um, she is my daughter. So <laughs> <laughs> along those lines. So, you know, I, I worry about a bit of fatalism there, you know, on our, on our part of our youths. And um, I just, you know, it's really hard as a mom to think about what that feels like for your kid. And you just want to try and instill, you know, resilience and things will get better. And, you know, this is an opportunity to try and make things better, come out of this stronger. Um, but sometimes you're just like a little, yeah. <laughs> um, we talked about the, the lasting effects. Um, we talked about the current situation. We talked about positives and negatives, um, of the situation. Um, are there any, um, activities in your work or personal life that you're delaying or consider uh, canceling. I know um, the Junior Service League has canceled Viva El Vino, and I imagine I've heard, you know, on NPR that um, this is prime gala and fundraising season. Um, how is that? Is that affecting um, your organization much? Well, um, our directly our organization, we really don't do fundraisers or events of that kind. Um, unless it's a major year anniversary, because we work directly one on one with donors. And um, so it's not affecting us, but we're very, very concerned about our nonprofits who rely on that 
um, revenue, event revenue, big fundraising season mm -hmm. of spring, whether it's galas or, um, you know, just outside events, runs and, you know, this, that. All tournaments, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so really concerned because that's revenue you can't necessarily make up. Um, even if we are back to some amount of gathering in the fall, I really foresee that it will still be limited. Um, and, and, you know, our entire fundraising or our nonprofit community can't just all go, we're all having our event in September <laughs> um, and October. I, it's really going to be challenging. And so they're, um, their revenues that help support their general support is what we're concerned about. So of course we're thinking about that and how, how we can help. We're a relatively small community foundation compared to some of the front range. So um, we of course are in constant contact with our colleagues and funders on the, on the uh, front front range of, of Colorado. And we're hoping that, you know, like there's been in the response time that there is still, you know, lots of collaborating and um, lots of support for our Western Slope nonprofits um, as they go through that longer period of, of struggling with that challenge. Um, myself in my world, you know, I've had to cancel some vacation plans. Um, I was about to go to the beach as kind of things shut down and um you know that's i'll live <laughs> so um i'm really you know again blessed not to uh impacted as some of our neighbors and friends and uh community are um is there anything i think i think i'm about out of questions for you is there anything that I missed or that you'd want to touch on, anyone you'd want to highlight or any organization that you're um, exceptionally proud of or pulls on your heartstrings, um, anything else that you want to include? Sure. Well, I could name probably a thousand examples of our community here and across our nonprofits um, on the Western Slope. Um, I've been, you know, that that collaboration between the businesses and um, our nonprofits is really, and just, you know, to see people come together like that. Um, we have a donor that immediately contacted us as this fit. Um, and out of his generous spirit and those of his friends and neighbors and family said, um, you know, these stimulus checks are coming we don't need them. We're, you know, we're relatively well off. We um, are, are retired, but, um, and so live on kind of a retirement, but really we're well off. And so that ignited an effort called West Slope Cares where um, they, it, you know, really wasn't on our part, but they specifically put out the word and are running a campaign that says, if you don't need your stimulus check, why not donate, donate it to, um, you know, somebody that uh, really needs it and do it through the community foundation. It's stuff like that, that you're just like blown away by people's generosity. Um, but the nonprofits themselves, so resilient and so innovative in turning around. I have to shout out to Western Colorado Area Health Education, um, because, you know, Georgia was one of the first people I talked to. Um, I knew, as she always is, she is boots on the ground saying, what can I do? And that response where you guys were able to gear up to um, respond to the need for home health and CNAs and all of that. And um, I know what your staff capacity is. I know you know, what, what you guys go through to run your programs to begin with, but then to see like, I, I, you know, Georgia, basically, I don't care. This needs to happen and we're doubling and tripling our capacity. Yeah. And do it, we'll do it under the safeguards of, um, you know, uh, safe distancing and all of that, but we'll do it. And then, um, you know, everything from that to, I've watched our homeless shelter here who, was in the midst of and hopefully 
any time now opening their um, family and women and children center. And it's been a long, hard road for them to raise that money and to raise that building. Um, and, uh, you know, all of a sudden, like all of that had to stop. And what they had to look at is how can we best protect our homeless population? And they looked at some really innovative things and really quickly put a plan in place to help um, separate their clients um, at the shelter, which is not easy to do. Mm -hmm. Shelters that we know are crowded anyways. Um, and then also to go further and make plans for um, if they had to quarantine people and how would that look uh, in the limited space that they had. There's just story upon story, our community food bank here. Um, so, um, you know, so very challenged with the immediate um, escalation of percentages of people that they saw and not being able to serve them in their normal manner. Come in, get your box of food, fill out this paperwork immediately threw out up tents on the outside. And um, we've seen pictures and video of the lines of cars going out the street, down the block, around the corner um, for folks that are newly found, found themselves in this situation. And it's just, um, you, you tend to be really proud um, when you see these nonprofits and with very, very little just responding because they know the need is so great. Um, and I also have to say, you know, as, as great as all our nonprofit leaders are, they're people too. Um, and so one of the things, you know, that has helped me is that I'm able to get on the phone and talk to community leaders, um, nonprofit leaders and say, how are you doing? What do you need? And you know, some of them are on the verge, if not straight out in tears, just saying, thank you for calling. It's been really tough. Um, you know, they're seeing clients and people and families struggling. Um, and so for someone to reach out to them and say, are you doing okay? You know, hey, let's, let's talk. Let's have a virtual cup of coffee. Um, so just, you know, making sure everybody's okay. Yeah. Well, we're so grateful for you. We have um, used that. We're in the midst of using your scholarship money right now with the class that's um, new to us on the weekends and um, opportunity for people to, to get into the workforce and do, do that work caring for our most fragile people. So we sure appreciate you and the foundation and all your support from our community. Um, Someone might be in touch with you after this um, at a later date to get more feedback or clarification. I am not sure about a timeline for when all of these videos. Um, I want to get mine wrapped up within the next week. Um, I think it's really critical to sort of record these as, as they're happening. Um, because, you know, as time goes by, people forget the intensity of their emotion behind the situation. Um, that's fine. Anything you need, Nicole. And, uh, you know, thank you guys for doing this. I have to say it's one of the things our um, Community Impact Council is talking about because we recognize even as we get through this um, that there are major lessons to be learned, um, both good and bad. Um, there is, you know, things to celebrate um, in, in terms of what, how our community did rise to the occasion. But like you say, you want to get this in the immediate. Um, we have talked about that it's very important to not go so long um, and not have that community conversation and, um, and just take, take what we can, take what we've learned out of this and um, what can we do better? And like we talked about, what does that illuminate? Mm -hmm. um, problems already um, that are challenging our community. So how can we how can we work with this information um, to improve? I really see that there's an opportunity for our our entire nation to make some fundamental changes to help improve the lives of many many people. 
and whether it's with telehealth and technology or shining a spotlight on the difference in class that exists and racial disparities that exist, um, you know, so many good things can come from this tragedy. That's right. Amen to that. Amen to that. Um, again, thank you for your time, Teddy. It was so nice to talk to you.